Hi all, I have another absolutely amazing and intriguing game to show you today. Leela against Stockfish in round 40. Let's have a look at this game. So E4, we have E6. So Leela, as we've seen, was com was crushed basically tactically uh, to a large extent in the previous uh, game with this opening, the French Defence Winnower variation. So we quote, go quite deep in uh, in the opening book here, move eight, knight b c six, the end of the book. We have knight f three, f five, and Leela also doesn't take on f six, but rather punks the queen on g three. We have queen a five, bishop d two, b six, and now h four. Stockfish plays a very interesting move indeed. F four. Okay, this commits the pawn. It could be a target in the long term. Uh, so Leela's plan was c4 in fact uh, in the previous game maybe not this exact position but that's the general thing she closed up position over there this stockfish uh, method seems interesting we have queen g4 uh, on bishop takes f4 uh, queen takes c3 check and this is going to be uh, giving black an advantage on a plate basically so um, queen g4 Queen a4, and you can see there's a lot of pressure on d4. And Stockfish is also uh, coordinating, that's like a common square, because the knight can also join in on that f4, um, uh, from f5 to hit d4. Now, with the center under such fire, leader actually plays h5. And guess what? After c takes d4, we have h6, is the dreaded form pawn going to be installed here well there's a mate threat immediately on the setup of this form pawn which which has to be parried of course uh, so just to examine though if h6 wasn't played c takes it seems also isn't a total disaster here with h6 just later this isn't a total uh, terrible position for white either uh, in fact white might have have a small edge there but uh, h6 immediately, we have g6. On knight g6, that is a disaster. Bishop takes, and this position with hg, and I'm threatening rook h8 checkmate. Uh, and here, queen e8 would be checkmate. So g6 needed. White castles, knight f5. Uh, so you can see that um, f4 is on the fire potentially. Uh, what about d takes instead let's have a quick look at that bishop takes white could take there on f5 then play queen h4 and in this position bishop d2 and f4 is going to drop white's ending up with a nice advantage there uh, okay so knight f5 c takes and we have some simplification knight takes knight takes queen takes and the queens come off so a massive simplification there and you might think after knight d6 has stockfish basically equalized here it doesn't seem that big a deal if we, we step back and look at this position the fascinating thing about the form pawn is it's not just the middle game its influence is beneficial you know for mating nets and stuff or for hooks for, for attacking pieces in the end game it's it's restricting the king in the end game the pawn is only two squares from queening but also in this scenario, what's particularly interesting as well, the dark square strategy, these dark squares have kind of been punctured a bit more, especially f6. That could be an entry point for the king uh, to travel to later. Um, this kind of route in on the dark squares could be useful to white later. Steinitz uh, thought that the king was an attacking piece and, and should be used, especially towards the end game. It becomes much more of an attacking piece. So this kind of puncturing of the dark squares, uh, especially you know f6, uh, could be dangerous for black from a long-term perspective of the form pawn. So the form pawn is, um, you know, the two perspectives, not just middle game but end game as well. Uh, it's very interesting. If white on this tactical move had taken on d6, this is virtually nothing uh, for white to write home about especially after bishop a6 pinning that pawn so the bishop retreats humbly and it looks as though black's got an aggressive knight as well and white doesn't really want to take there because that would open up 
potentially this diagonal. So we have bishop b4, rook d8. Uh, so now bishop c3, we have bishop b7, a4, rook a c8, bishop d4, knight a5, f4. And you really might not think, is this such a big deal? This position, white's got the bishop pair, it's fairly closed. But not only that, white's structure doesn't look great either. There's isolated pawns here, basically. Black's got that semi-open file. Why would, why would this be at all good for white? You can only just refer back to these, this idea that the, the form pawn is actually part of the dark square campaign. The funny thing is, also that's amplified with white having the dark square bishop without a counterpart. In fact, the bishop can also target these two dark squares as well. So on both sides of the board, dark squares are under scrutiny here. We see knight c6, and the bishop doesn't move. It keeps a lock and key over the d5 pawn. Because uh, otherwise, on d4, you know, this would open up the bishop, and the bishop would move, move somewhere. D4, opening up the bishop, maybe the knight reroutes later to f5. And that bishop's good on the diagonal. But no, c3, preparing for an opposite. Um, sorry, knight takes is not an opposite color bishop scenario, though, but preparing for more potential simplification. We see rook c7. Now, just as an example here, on knight takes, c takes. It looks as though surely black's activity is worth something. There are two key moves in this variation, uh, which seem both to be quite positive for white. For example, bishop e2. Uh, although you know this pawn is isolated, it's a battering ram. It's like one of the fundamentals of the minority attack when it, a minority of pawns outrageously attacks the majority. Is that to inflict structural damage? So your battering ram doesn't need to be structurally perfect to be a battering ram. The A pawn is actually quite dangerous in this variation because, for example, rook c2, rook f2, a5 is in the air here as a battering ram. Once that happens, bishop b5 is a nice key move uh, to threaten bishop d7, a nice uh, important tempo gaining move. And to be able to chop down these pawns on the uh, a file. So say this, you know, parrying bishop d7. Uh, this situation is just going to be favouring white in this endgame. The king can go up the board. The rook's uh, got a strong influence there. You know, with rook a7 check, you know, potentially restricting the king to the back row as as a sort of nightmare endgame scenario. You know, imagine this scenario where the king is coming up to f6. Intriguing how although black's got activity and white did have a have a bad structure, uh, this structure is not so bad now. Uh, but a5 remains a battering ram. So bishop e2, just to recap here. Um, there's also uh, even rook f3. Even this, apparently, it, it seems uh, is working quite well for white generally. This kind of scenario uh, where the king can you know march down on, on the dark squares. It's good. As an example, say black has to play rook f7 here to parry king f6. Uh, white taking out e6 is okay here, even if the form pawn is lost with this check. So that would drive the king away and lose the form pawn. But after this, you know, white's got rook d6 and this e6 pawn, it's still a big advantage for white, even in this kind of scenario. So that's pretty interesting how the king march can uh, end up winning a key pawn there. You might ask, well, hold on a sec. Why not King F7 to hold E6? On King F7, uh, then G4 becomes possible, which stops Rook H5 check. Uh, if Rook H5 a check had been played, then King F6. So Black can't have everything all at once, uh, basically. So King F7, we play G4, and actually White gets an advantage this way with playing for F5. Uh, it's quite impressive how doesn't matter how it's sliced, these endgame scenarios can end up really with white having the advantage. So that hits d5. It's very, very, very bad for black indeed. So anyway, uh, so after rook c7, so in the game, after c3, rook c7 was played, not knight takes d4. Now we have g4, as though f5 is going to be interesting. For white, we have bishop c8 kind of suppressing f5. 
uh, on Rook E8, uh, it seems, you know, it's not entirely clear if Black's position will actually crumble. If White's quite forcing like this, what could potentially happen is Black setting up uh, a kind of fortress at least. And, and it's not that convincing if White should be able to break through in this kind of position. But uh, in the game, okay, we have Bishop C8, King H2. Uh, king g3, the king marching potentially on these on this dark square road. King h4, knight b3. Rook a2, knight c5. The bishop drops back to e2. And now knight b7. You might think, what about the more active looking knight e4? It turns out a4 is pretty good here. For example, this scenario where uh, white's getting a nice edge there, for example. Uh, there's also pins to factor in here so taking on c3 um, might be uh, a bit uh, tactically disastrous so uh, okay so bishop e2 knight b7 fin chattering the knight c4 now and this does keep things kind of more open on the board this potential fortress uh, scenarios um, are, are limited now on the queen side d takes Rook c2, so a temporary pawn sack with no support for b5, a4 sorted that one out. It's basically opening up uh, a couple of uh, files. So here, uh, rook e c8 on taking bishop takes hits uh, e6. And there might be things like f5 after that. So black just played this, stockfish played that. Rook b4. And it looks as though it's not just this side of the board, but this side of the board with dark squares under great scrutiny. Rook c2. Bishop a6. And now uh, leader is not minding potentially getting rid of this knight. In fact, volunteers the knight. So volunteering an opposite colored bishop endgame. Is this really sufficient? Well, with the open c and d files, as well as king's uh, the king's en potential entrance points on f6, this is actually rather dangerous for black. Rook d1. King f8, we have a5, b5, which opens up some dark squares on this side of the board as well. It's it's quite aesthetically pleasing, the dark square play here. Bishop e3, rook bc7, king g5, so the king's marching in, Steinitz will be proud. Rook d6, rook 2 to c4, rook b3, b4, uh, on bishop c6, it turns out here that white could actually infiltrate via d8 with great effects. For example, like this, coordinate against d8 and crashing through like this. Uh, with now controlling uh, the exit squares of the king, this makes this a kind of mating net potentially, or, or winning material at least. Absolutely like winning material there. So very, very dangerous there. So b4 was played. Uh, now we have rook d4, takes, takes, a6. So rook takes b4. So leader is now officially a pawn up, but can the opposite color bishops save stockfish? Let's see what happens. So uh, some nice maneuvering. So king f6 there. You might think, well, the, the thing is, uh, white's threatening things like bishop a3 now and you know rook d7. There, there are entry points and there are attacking points. So the king looks set to get into f6. So very, very aggressive king indeed. Rook c7. And now another pawn drops, a key pawn drops. Yes, it, it, it is starting to look extremely uh, bad uh, for black. After king takes e6, check. Rook c4, g5, not minding uh, locking up the pawn, safeguarding that pawn, safeguarding the form pawn. Uh, that's very important, form pawn. <laughs> okay, so bishop d4, bishop c5. Rook b2, and yeah, the king's just so much more aggressive than the black king. Hitting the bishop, now preparing potentially to use that c-file after taking a6, another a very dangerous outside pass pawn there. And now after bishop d8, rook c7, bishop f6, taking this and now the pawn is only two squares away from queening so two outside pass pawns the game actually ended here both engines thought it was like plus 10 so 10 plies at plus 10 adjudicated uh, as a win for white a possible continuation here 
King b4, rook a1, rook f7, uh, and now h7 is, is going to be winning more material by queening. So I thought the game was quite intriguing, actually, because it looked as though, hold on a sec, white's structure isn't that great. Um, the structure, went, once it was repaired, uh, st still left white with very strong kind of persistent uh, dark square advantages in the endgame, the king being able to infiltrate. So it's interesting, the influence of the form pawn here was quite vivid for the endgame implications. It was amplified by white having the dark square bishop without a counterpart. And white was actually able to pierce uh, into dark squares on the queen side as well. Also interesting was the c4 move to sort of open up the c and d files, which made infiltration a lot easier later. You know, potential threats of infiltration uh, down to d8. So quite an instructive and profound game. Uh, it seems when we see games like this against Stockfish, which is like the master of, of tactics, to see that kind of positional play can can really be this effective is, is quite impressive, I feel. If you enjoyed this game, please click on the top left box, which should appear shortly, to become a member at chessworld.net, play against other YouTubers. You can also test yourself on the variations covered in this and other game videos from the improved menu puzzle books option, which has a link to the annotated game. Comments, questions, donations, see the description. Like, share, subscribe with the notification bell. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. This is the puzzle book for the game in question we've just checked over. So uh, white's play and black gets made in here. Uh, this is in the bad bishop takes, uh, sorry, knight g6 idea, where we play hg, threatening rook, rook h8, queen e8 is checkmate there. Okay, white play for a clear edge here. Bishop takes, I think we can, uh, is it taking immediately? Queen h4, bishop d2, hitting f4. Might play for a clear uh, advantage here. Um, I think the key move is bishop b5 here, threatening bishop d7. Oh, no, not quite. Okay, rook takes. Oh, we can play like this. Nope. Bishop d3. Now taking. I think this endgame favours white. Okay, white playing for a clear edge here. I think protecting like that. Uh, clear advantage here. A5. And, oh. Bishop b5 or bishop d3, maybe bishop d3. Yeah, take out this knight or not. Then take here. Even though it's opposite color bishops, I think this is it's pleasant for white on both sides of the board for dark square play. Okay, um, by the way, talking of Steinitz like we did, uh, there's actually a new key. Uh, if you look at famous players, you can see Steinitz. If you want to check over his uh, or on the famous players section, uh, you'll see he's the the latest entry. There's 112 puzzles to check out throughout Steinitz's uh, career, who was the first old chess champion and raved about how the king is like a fighting piece. One of his quotations. So you might want to check uh, that out. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thanks very much.